Good morning or good afternoon, or maybe even a good evening. So we thank the IMS to organize this webinar every month in place of this meeting, which unfortunately have not been held in, in presential. And uh, I am Anne Gompel from Université de Paris. And my pleasure today is to introduce this topic on uh, weight gain at mid midlife with two excellent speakers. So the first one is Professor Ekta Kapoor. She will speak about body weight, what happens at menopause. She is an associate professor at Mayo Clinic and uh, is um, uh, directing the Mayo Clinic Center for Women's Health. She's an endocrinologist and has already been interested in menopause and obesity. So I am sure that uh, talk will be of full interest for this uh, question, which is extremely important for women and for the physician and health caretakers who are involved in uh, women's health. The second speaker is uh, Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford. She will speak about what treatment strategy can be, can we offer for obesity? She works at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She was one of the first fellowship trained in obesity medicine. And um, she, is, uh, now, she has now joined the faculty in Harvard Medical School. So thank you for the two speakers to join the, this IMS uh, webinar. And uh, thank you as well to Bezin, who supported this webinar by an unrestricted educational uh, grant. And um, he has no role in selection of topics and speakers, and I've not reviewed the content of the speakers' presentations. So you can ask questions during all the talks, and then the question and answer will be held at the end of the two talks. So thank you for joining us today. And now I give the panel and the uh, to uh, Professor Hekta Kapoor. Thank you so much, Dr. Gompel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to be talking to all of you on this uh, very important topic of midlife and weight gain in women. And I feel very privileged also to be sharing the stage with Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford today. So we're very happy to be here with you to talk on this important topic. So my part of the talk will cover body weight, what happens at menopause, what happens in midlife, and then Dr. Fatima Cody Stanford will be covering management issues. So I've left the hard part for her to do. <laughs> So these are my disclosures. So starting the uh, setting up the stage with the clinical scenario, which I'm thinking you're very well familiar with. This is something you've probably already encountered in your menopause practice, or if you're just starting practice, you're very likely to one of the very common situations that we see. So this is an actual patient that I saw in my clinic, a 52 year old female in good health previously, her last menstrual period was about two years ago, so she's in menopause. She's having bothersome hot flashes and night sweats, but that's not even the reason why she came to be seen. In her own words, she is devastated and depressed by weight gain of about 15 pounds, which has happened in the last four to five years. And unfortunately, it seems to concentrate in the wrong area, as she referred to it, in the abdominal area. And again, in her own words, she's never seen belly fat before. Her body mass index is now up to 28 kilogram per meter square. So putting her in the overweight category. And she's telling me that she watches her diet very closely, just the way she has all these years, and it seemed to work for her. And she walks one to two miles a day. 
again, something she's done for years and it's worked for weight maintenance, but all of a sudden it doesn't seem to. So she is asking me, why am I gaining weight despite doing everything right? In other words, doing everything the way I have over the years, but all of a sudden now, I don't seem to be keeping my weight stable. Is there anything I should be doing to prevent this from happening or fix it, go back to my baseline weight? And then as it always comes up in discussions like these for midlife women, she asks me, should I be on estrogen to get rid of this excess body fat? Now I'm sitting in my chair and trying to come up with an intelligent response to give to this patient. What do I tell her? Do I tell her that this is an aging effect, not much we can do about? Do I tell her, oh, this happens to all menopausal women, you know, not a very intelligent response. Uh, do we get a little confrontational? Again, this topic comes up whenever we're counseling patients about weight, we talk about diet, we talk about physical activity. Do I tell her, you might be underestimating your dietary intake. These are some of the thoughts going through my mind as I'm trying to talk to this patient about her problem. So with this background, the objectives of my part of the talk are going to be to review weight and body composition changes that occur around menopause. So what are these changes? And then what causes these changes? So, you know, when we talk about midlife weight gain in women and midlife defined as being between the ages of 40 to 65, I just want to state up front that there are two issues really to consider and they do not always occur concurrently. And that's very important to appreciate. So there are two issues really. One is weight gain per se. And the second, perhaps a more important issue is the body composition changes. So when we're talking just generic weight gain, very simply stated, that's just gain of fat mass. Usually people can gain weight by gaining muscle mass also, but in common parlance, generic weight gain is gain of fat mass. This happens to be a very common complaint in midlife women. And if things are just allowed to follow their own course, kind of what was happening to my patient. Midlife, will, midlife women will gain an average of about, about pound and a half per year. And as a result, two thirds of women over the age of 40 years in our country, in the United States, suffer from overweight or obesity. And that number goes even higher. Three fourths of the women more than 60 years will suffer from overweight or obesity. Now, as you can imagine, as you've probably encountered personally or in your practice, this is one of the most bothersome symptoms that women come to menopause clinics with. Sometimes this is even more bothersome than vasomotor symptoms, the hot flushes and the night sweats, kind of how my patient was, that even though she had quite bad hot flashes and night sweats, her main concern in the clinic to me was this weight gain. So this is just gain of fat mass. But like I said, there is something else happening at the same time, which is the body composition changes. And while it usually occurs concurrently with weight gain, with gain of fat mass, it can sometimes happen independent of weight gain per se. And I'll explain that here in a little bit. So what are the body composition changes that are occurring? These women are losing lean mass, which means loss of muscle and bone. And these are age-related changes. There is also body fat redistribution, meaning there is increased predisposition for the excess body fat to be deposited in the abdominal sites, both subcutaneous and visceral. Now that's a change from younger years where there is a greater inclination for this fat to be deposited in the lower body, if you will. But here in midlife women, we see a change in the body fat distribution patterns with a greater predisposition for abdominal obesity. And this typically results in expansion of the waist circumference. Now, like I said, even though usually these changes are happening concurrently with weight gain, sometimes they can happen in the absence of overall weight gain. And that's very important to appreciate. So how do we reconcile this fact? 
if you think about it in a woman if she loses muscle mass to a degree that even though she is concurrently gaining fat mass her overall weight might stay the same and that happens sometimes in our clinical practice that the weight as she's going through midlife stays the same because as she's gaining the fat mass muscle mass is going down but at the same time the percentage of abdominal fat and the worse out, out of subcutaneous and visceral being the visceral fat that percentage is going up but the overall weight is really not changing a whole lot and as you can imagine it's these body fat distribution changes that i just described they are a bigger problem than even weight gain per se because these are or this change is what predicts metabolic complications so hypertension type 2 diabetes dyslipidemia and perhaps even coronary artery disease now it's very well known to this audience that coronary artery disease is the number one killer of postmenopausal women so we have to stop and think that you know these body composition changes these body fat distribution changes are in large part explaining this increased risk of metabolic complications in postmenopausal women so then the age old question really has been that okay these are the changes they are gaining weight they are having body composition changes what is causing it is it aging is it menopause or is it a little bit of both because these women are experiencing both menopause and aging at the same time so when it comes to just the weight gain itself there are several well conducted longitudinal studies across the menopause transition including the swan study of women's health across the nation and the healthy women study and several other smaller studies out there which have informed us regarding this question and it seems pretty clear that it, when it comes to weight gain per se it is predominantly an age related influence kind of what happens in both sexes it happens to men too so it does not seem to be dictated as much by the reproductive stage or the menopausal status it's mainly an aging effect meaning adjust for aging there really is no weight gain per se associated with the menopausal transition so in both the swan and the healthy women study what the investigators found was that women gained between 2 to 2.3 kilograms on an average over a 3 year follow up during the menopause transition and again like i said this seemed to be a result of aging itself so and one wonders that what is it that's happening with aging that's promoting gain of fat mass so i'll spend this next slide explaining as to what we think is behind that as we get older again this affects both men and women equally we lose muscle mass and ultimately in more se severe cases it can be sarcopenia for losing muscle mass there is a decrease in physical activity and that's an important point because this may be subtle subtle to the point that it may not even be perceived by the patient and remember my clinical case that i presented that woman was telling me that the way i move around my physical activity level really hasn't changed so i'm perplexed as to why this is happening but the truth is there are subtle changes in physical activity that may not be perceived by the patient the pace at which at which we move the time that we spend in moderate to severe intensity exercise changes so we are losing muscle mass we're not the our physical activity level is not as intense what does that translate into if you think about it muscle is the site where we are burning most of our calories and it accounts for majority of the so called resting energy expenditure so we're burning fewer calories at rest because we have lower muscle mass we're burning fewer calories with activity because we're not spending as much time in moderate to severe intensity activity as we're getting older so if we don't alter how we eat or how how many calories go inside we end up with a positive energy balance so if we keep doing things the way we have over the years in terms of our dietary habits we end up with a positive energy balance and that leads to increased adiposity and weight gain now when it comes to dietary patterns with aging with aging we really haven't seen a consistent pattern it can go in any direction but really it's the loss of muscle mass 
and the decrease in resting and physical activity related energy expenditure, thereby total energy expenditure, that most likely explains the uh, uh, fact that we end up with a positive energy balance. Now, we also have to understand some unique challenges that midlife women face that keep them from doing the right thing when it comes to adopting a healthy lifestyle. Now, these are very important to acknowledge because when we're offering counseling to these patients regarding weight loss and weight maintenance, these issues absolutely have to be addressed because if they are not, we are not likely to be successful in our weight management recommendations. So what are those? Vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, sleep disruption, which could be a result of the night sweats or independent of night sweats that is known to occur in midlife women. Mood problems, a woman with a severe mood disorder is very unlikely to be motivated enough to eat healthy and to exercise regularly. A lot of times midlife women experience non-specific musculoskeletal complaints, diffuse aches and pains, which may or may not meet the threshold for diagnosis of fibromyalgia. Then the other thing with this age group of women is the busy lifestyle that they deal with, the stress of being the so-called sandwich generation, teenage children in the house, aging parents. So these are busy, busy women dealing with physical health issues and a lot going on in life. So sometimes it is hard for them to adhere to a healthy lifestyle, even though they have the knowledge of it, they have the recognition and insight, but it can be challenging. So this, these aspects are important to keep in the back of your mind when you're talking to a woman about weight management, that these issues need to be brought up actively, even if the patient does not bring them up and address them appropriately. So then the question is, what about estrogen and fat metabolism? I talked to you about aging. What does menopause itself do, menopause transition? How does that affect this whole weight question? So estrogen receptors are known to occur on adipocytes. The effect of estrogen on adipocytes varies by site, so subcutaneous versus visceral. So what happens is that estrogen induces lipolysis via lipoprotein lipase in visceral fat and inhibits it in subcutaneous fat depots. So if you think about this for a second, this is why the premenopausal women tend to have the so-called gynoid body fat distribution, meaning they tend to have more of the fat in the lower half of their body, the thighs, the buttocks. But the estrogen loss that occurs with menopause, as you can imagine, that inhibits the lipolysis in the visceral sites, leading to increased abdominal adiposity. Now, the important thing to appreciate is that studies have shown us that this lack of estrogen-mediated increased abdominal adiposity is independent of age effect, total body fat, and level of physical activity. And this is, again, an important thing to recognize and understand because all of these things that I've listed here, aging, total body fat, and level of physical activity, they all impact where you carry your body fat. And they all tend to have an influence on increasing visceral adiposity. Older people have more visceral fat. People who have overall higher amount of total body fat will have more visceral body fat. But then even if you adjust for all of these confounders, estrogen independently increase, or lack of estrogen independently increases visceral body fat. So that's again an important thing to understand that even though we are saying that aging is the one that's probably driving the weight gain itself, lack of estrogen has a direct influence on the body fat distribution changes that are the hallmark of the menopause transition. So again, as I was saying, under the influence of these hormones, predominantly estrogen, the gynoid body fat distribution in premenopausal women transitions to the so-called android patterns or in, in the abdominal area after menopause. And as women become men-like, if you will, in their body fat distribution patterns, they also start showing patterns of disease that we see in men, meaning increased risk of hypertension, increased risk of coronary artery disease, higher risk of diabetes, which seem to occur after women enter menopause. 
Then we have some recent intriguing data on FSH from animal studies, which have not been confirmed in humans. But these are very interesting data. And there seems to be a suggestion that FSH, the elevated FSH itself, and not so much, and not just the lack of estrogen itself, it seems to be a contributor to increased adiposity and reduced uh, energy expenditure, uh, reduced resting energy expenditure, the elevated FSH itself. So this was an interesting study that appeared in the journal Nature in 2017. It was a mouse model study where they showed that use of an FSH blocking antibody, so which blocks the action of these high FSH levels that you see in menopause over an eight week period, there was increased lean body mass in these mice and reduced body fat. Meaning somehow if you block the effect of that elevated FSH in these mice models, they had more lean body mass and they had reduced body fat. So again, very intriguing data, kind of what we have seen somewhat for hot flashes also, where we think that the elevated FSH may have a role in addition to the low estrogen but these have not been confirmed in human study, but something to keep in mind in terms of the mechanisms that are driving all these changes in midlife. What about the menopause transition and ectopic fat deposition? So I spoke to you about visceral fat, but what about ectopic fat? So menopause transition is associated with increased fat deposition in the heart and in the liver. And the pericardial fat deposition, which has been linked to menopause and low estrogen levels is particularly interesting because it occurs independently of age. And it's also an independent risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And the theories out there are that it is because of release of cytokines, which have easy access to the myocardium because of the proximity. So, we have learned what are the changes that are happening in midlife with respect to weight, body composition. What's the clinical significance really? So next few slides, I'll focus on that. Why do we care? So one important thing to understand based on what I've said in the last few minutes is that women can experience increase in abdominal and visceral fat, which can occur in the absence of weight gain. So in our practice, we have to move beyond the metric of body mass index of BMI when we are trying to assess the health risks of weight gain and obesity. BMI is an imperfect criterion in this group of patients for the reasons that we have discussed. So we need measures like waist circumference, which has its own problems, but it is a poor man's DEXA scan, if you will. Body composition studies using DEXA scans and MRIs, we really need to be assessing body composition changes and not just pure BMI. Because it is, it is this change, it is the change in the waist circumference and the body composition, which dictates the metabolic complications as we have discussed. This was an important study that came out last year, again, highlighting the importance of the so-called normal weight central obesity that I've been talking about. These were WHI data 156, over 156,000 postmenopausal women who had been enrolled in the Women's Health Initiative uh, study between 1993 to 1998. These were women who were in both the randomized control trial part and the observational uh, study part of the WHI. They were followed through February 2017, and the investigators reported that normal weight central obesity, so women having normal BMI, but having central obesity based on the weight circumference criterion had excess risk of all-cause mortality. They looked at CVD mortality, all-cause mortality, and cancer-related mortality, and the number of the risk of mortality there was comparable to the women with obesity and central obesity. Now, these data were very, very moving in that sense that we really need to be paying attention to the central obesity, the visceral fat, and not just weight, because even women who with the so-called normal weight have an excess risk of mortality if they have central obesity. Elevated BMI and adiposity in midlife women is also associated, as you know, with increased risk of breast and endometrial cancer. And these women also tend to report more frequent or severe vasomotor symptoms. 
So Dr. Stanford will be focusing on the management issues, which like I said, is the harder part. I've told you what happens, but really what the patients want to know from us is what do I do about it? So she will be covering those issues in great detail, but I just wanted to highlight in the next couple of slides, some issues that are unique to midlife women that we need to keep in mind when we are counseling them for weight management. Recognition and validation is very important. These patients will often come to your office confused that I'm doing everything right. I haven't changed a thing, but still bad things are happening. So what I tell my patients, my standard punchline there is that the rules of the game have changed. You are gaining weight because you've not been able to change anything. And then I explain the pathophysiology. As I've discussed with you, if we do not change the way we eat, if we do not change our dietary practices, we are very likely to gain weight with aging. So it is because nothing has changed that you are gaining weight and then they understand when I, so that's sort of my standard punchline there. So we have to be actively screening for overweight and obesity and offering counseling to these women. And like I said, it's very important to address the unique barriers in these women as they relate to vasomotor symptoms, sleep problems and mood disorders. When it comes to addressing the menopause symptoms, vasomotor symptoms really are the big ones. Estrogen therapy is most effective and the right patient, it is the first, uh, frontline therapy if there is no contraindication. Estrogen therapy, repeated studies have shown, doesn't have any effect on weight per se, but it does improve body fat distribution by reducing central adiposity. So a recent meta-analysis in fact showed that there is a 6.8% reduction in abdominal fat in women who go on hormone therapy. So these are important numbers to share with patients. Obviously, we're not gonna be putting anybody on estrogen for weight loss or to improve their body fat distribution patterns, but if they are about to start estrogen for another reason, like hot flashes or a mood disorder, then we can anticipate favorable body fat distribution changes in that patient. In your patient in whom estrogen may be contraindicated for any reason, or the patient doesn't want to go on estrogen, and you're managing vasomotor symptoms or a mood disorder or insomnia with agents like selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or gabapentin, you want to be careful about choosing weight neutral options or options that are not going to impact weight significantly. So these issues become important in that situation. So with that, I'm going to end and give the stage to my colleague, Dr. Stanford, so she can discuss management issues with you. Thank you so much. So good morning, everyone. It's a delight to see you. Um, it's, it was great to hear Dr. Kapoor speak to us today about obesity, particularly in the midlife, but also this idea of weight gain. Today, I'm going to do some deep dive in terms of discussing with you the pathophysiology of obesity outside of what Dr. Kapoor mentioned, specifically in the midlife um, woman, but also just looking at it in a broader sense. I want us to think also about the language that we're using when we're talking to patients that have this disease of obesity. We want to make sure that we do not call them obese patients. Obese is a label. Obesity is a disease. So you want to say a patient with obesity, for example. And I also want to delete that term morbid obesity out of our vocabulary. It's important for us to recognize that the appropriate term would be severe obesity. A morbid is um, another stigmatizing term that we often utilize when talking about patients that have the disease of obesity. Um, severe obesity would be correct. We don't call it morbid cancer. We don't call it morbid heart disease. So we need to be respectful of this patient population. I think that's entirely important. Um, so today we're gonna to look at strategies for um, how we care for the patients with obesity. My disclosures are listed as noted here. Um, there are a few clinical questions that we're going to entertain um, during my time with you um, to compliment Dr. Kapoor's talk that was um, lovely and that she gave just a few moments ago. Um, what is the approach to the patient who has difficulty losing weight? What are labs and elements of the history and physical that are helpful for management? What are considerations for prescribing medications for weight reduction? And, and what is the recommended follow-up for maximizing success with these patients? And what, when are surgical interventions indicated and how should we prepare for such a consultation? So we have this BMI chart and one of the questions that came up up for, I think, a Dr. Dini in the chat was, you know, is BMI the end-all be-all? And absolutely not. I think one of the key things that Dr. Poor ca captured in her talk 
was this idea of looking at weight distribution. When that weight is distributed centrally, we are really concerned because it leads to metabolic disease. So we really wanna think about that. But when we do look at how obesity is defined by World Health Organization definitions, this is what we see in the BMI criteria. So a person has underweight if their BMI is less than 18 and a half. A person has normal weight status if they're between 18 and a half and 24.9. Someone has overweight when they're between 25 and 29.9. And then we get into these classes of obesity, class one, class two, class three, mild, moderate, and severe obesity, BMI of 30 to 34.9 being mild, moderate being a 35 to 39.9, and those that have severe obesity, a BMI greater than or equal to 40. Now, I want us to hone in on energy balance. I think this is important for us to discuss because this helps us set up the framework for how we converse and treat our patients that may have overweight or obesity. Now, what we've learned is that energy balance is very simple. It's about calories in, our food and beverage intake, and our calories out, our bodily functions, our physical activity. If we can just balance these, then we should be exactly where we want to be with weight. Um, the problem is that this is indeed a fallacy. And if we continue to perpetuate this fallacy, we will we continue to fail in the treatment of our patients that do struggle with this disease of obesity? Let's learn about the complexity surrounding this disease. Obviously, it's a multifactorial disorder where genetics, environment, development, and behavior all play a role in a person's likelihood of having this disease. But I want us to hone in on the organ that's most important in regulating weight, and that is indeed the brain. I want us to hone in on the hypothalamus. It's important to note that the hypothalamus is really regulating weight. It's getting signals from our fat tissue, so our adipose tissue. It's getting signals from our large intestine, our small intestine, our pancreas and our stomach. It's sending signals back to the hypothalamus via the spinal and vagus nerves to tell us not only how much to eat, but how much to store. So let's look a little bit more at those substances where they're produced and their relevant effect on feeding. For example, ghrelin, which is produced in the fundus and in the inter and endocrine cells and in the neurons in the hypothalamus, its relevant effect on feeding is that it is orexigenic, which means that it stimulates one's appetite. Anandamides, which are produced in the small intestines, are also orexigenic. It stimulates one's appetite. If we're looking at insulin, of course, we're talking about endogenous insulin that is produced in the pancreas and the beta cells and the islets of Langerhans. Its relevant effect on feeding is that it is anorexigenic, which means that it promotes satiety. Of course, it plays a role with regards to glycogen and lipid storage. Leptin, which is produced in the short term in the stomach and in the long term in the adipocytes or the fat cells, its relevant effect on feeding is that it is anorexigenic, which means that it promotes satiety. CCK or cholecystokinin produced in the small intestine, really, really responsible for early satiety, also anorexigenic. It's also responsible for the release of digestive enzymes from the extracurricular pancreas, bile from the gallbladder, and then acid from parietal cells within the stomach. And then finally, peptide YY, which is produced in the distal portion of the small intestine, in the ileum, and then also in the large intestine, its relevant effect on feeding is that it is anorexigenic. So it's important for us to know that these substances actually have an effect on feeding. Now, here's one of my favorite slides. I know it looks like we're going back into our basic science days, but it's important for us to recognize how the body might be regulating weight with a focus here on the adipocyte or the fat cell. Now, when leptin binds to this receptor, it stimulates a neuron in our brain, which is called the POMC or the proopiomelanocortin neuron here in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. What happens is these alpha melanocyte stimulating hormones then bind to these melanocortin-4 receptors. It stimulates the production of BDNF, which stands for brain-derived neurotropic factor. And when patients travel down this lovely pathway, they receive an anorexic genetic signal, which means that not only do they eat less, they store less, okay? So that's great. That's for very lean individuals. For my patients, as I exclusively treat patients with overweight and obesity, they signal down an alternate pathway where leptin binds to a different receptor and stimulates a different neuron in the brain. 
This is called the AGRP or the agouti-related peptide neuron here in the paraventricular nucleus of the hypothalamus. It then inhibits the formation of brain-derived neurotropic factor. And these patients will see, receive an orexigenic signal, which means that food intake may go up, but also food storage goes up. So when we talk about this idea of weight set point, it's important to recognize this is very much influenced by these pathways by which one may travel down the brain. So let's just break this down a little bit because for my non-neuroscientist, I'm not a neuroscientist, this may have been a little bit crazy. So let's look at this. We have the brain, right? The brain is getting signals about our diet quality. We want it to look like you see on the screen now, lean proteins, whole grains, fruits, vegetables is your predominant source of intake. But just because your diet looks like that doesn't mean that you will have the weight status that you desire. I have patients with significant significant, very high body mass index that eat like that, but continue to store very high. Physical activity, we always hear about physical activity and the role it plays in weight regulation, but it's important to know that physical activity is really great for one primary thing with regards to weight status, and that is it helps to us to maintain our weight. Doesn't typically generate significant weight loss, but we often will tell our patients, oh, you need to go exercise to do X, Y, or Z. They've always already been exercising. Um, and so they're concerned about why that's not causing a significant weight shift is because that's not what it's intended to do. It has a lot of positive effects, but on average, it creates weight stability. Now, sleep duration and quality play a large role in how the body regulates weight when we're in the menopausal transition, night sweats, things of that sort, those vasomotor symptoms that Dr. Ford talked about can affect our sleep quality and duration. And I can do a whole lecture for an hour on sleep quality and weight, um, but we do know that that plays a role. Medications that we as doctors prescribe can cause significant weight shifts. Everything from lithium, Depakote, Tegretol, Celexa, Cymbalta, Fexor, Paxil, Prozac, Ambien, Trazodone, Lunesta, Gabapentin, Glyburide, Glipizide, Glimepiride, Atenolol, Metoprolol, Propanolol, long-term insulin, long-term prednisone, antihistamines, just to name the ones I could think of just at that very moment. These things can cause major shifts and weight regulation. So it's important to know that we are often, um, one of the things that may be a cause of this weight shift. Now this looks like another sleeping person, indeed it is, but the difference is this person is sleeping during the daytime. When we are sleeping during the daytime, that disrupts our circadian rhythm. When we see that happen, that influences the pathways that regulate weight in our brain. And so we really need to think about that and then finally, thermogenesis, which is just how much the body burns at rest and with activity. This is largely genetically determined, but does influence weight and weight um, strategies, okay? Now, this is one of my favorite slides. I told you the other one with the pathophys was one of my favorite. This is taken from the Obesity Society. Um, and what you can see is that the contributors for obesity are vast. And so that's why that kind of scale that I put up at the initial, one of the initial slides was incorrect because there are so many contributors to obesity. Um, things that happen inside of an individual, things that are outside of an individual. Um, what you can see here is that the things here at the top in this top row, these things increase one's intake. These things here at the bottom decrease expenditure. And then here in the middle, we have things that affect either intake or expenditure or we don't know yet. Now these colors actually mean something. These are contributors and influencers to obesity that fall under large categories, meaning biological or medical reasons why someone may struggle with weight, food and beverage behavior and environment, maternal and developmental, social, psychological, economic, and then environmental pressures on physical activity. Now, I'm not gonna go over all of those things that you saw in that chart, but I wanna pull out a few key um, contributors, both inside of the individual and external to the individual, that will help us understand how these can contribute to weight. Now, things that are inside of a person that may increase one's intake are hyperreactivity to environmental food cues, or delayed satiety, or disordered eating. Things that may decrease one's expenditure are the gut microbiota. So for example, we know that the bacteria in the gut of those that are lean versus those that have obesity differ drastically. So much so that here at Mass General, we're doing studies where we're taking the gut microbiota in the form of feces out of individuals that are lean and placing it in individuals that have obesity without making any shifts in diet or exercise and seeing weight changes associated with recolonizing with a different type of flora within the gut. 
thermogenesis we've talked about um, can decrease expenditure. And then physical disability. So if someone has a physical disability, not being able to move quite as much as someone that is more physically able. Now, increased intake and decreased expenditure can be related to genetic and epigenetic factors, age-related changes, which we have spoken about today, particularly important in women's lives, because there's three key points in a woman's life where we see major weight shifts. Um, at the onset of menses as an adolescent, um, if the, the woman decides to have children or gets pregnant, we can see major shifts. And then, of course, at this key area of time, the menopausal transition that we're speaking to you about today. And then finally, mood disturbances can increase intake and then decrease one's expenditure. Now, when we're looking at contributors to obesity that are outside of the individual, things that increase one's intake are things like environmental or chemical toxins, pervasive food advertising, or large portion sizes. Things that may decrease one's expenditure are the built environment, or sedentary time, or labor-saving devices. And finally, a few things that may decrease expenditure, um, or sorry, increase intake and then decrease expenditure, or weight bias and stigma, which is why I started this lecture talking about the language that we use when we're talking about our patients or with our patients that have obesity. Weight cycling, which means that idea of losing weight and starting on a new diet and gaining that back and things of that sort. And then maternal and paternal obesity is extremely important. It's important to recognize that if parents have obesity, the likelihood that their children will have obesity is on the order of 50 to 85% likelihood even if everything is optimized with regards to diet, exercise, and other lifestyle modifications. It's important to recognize that weight is indeed more heritable than height. All right, so let's look at the guidelines for selecting obesity treatment. You can see that across all weight classes, we can use diet, physical activity, and behavioral therapy. Um, we begin to entertain the use of pharmacotherapy once we get to a BMI of 27 to 29.9 along with comorbid conditions or obesity associated complications. And then when we think about metabolic and bariatric surgery, it's really in those that have obesity, particularly those that have moderate obesity and severe obesity. So that's important for us to note. Now we talked about kind of weight promoting medicines. I just published a large study that came out in menopause based on the Women's Health Initiative with um, co-author Joanne Manson, which covers an article that um, Dr. Kapoor covered in her lecture um, from JAMA Network Open um, in the latter portion of last year. Um, and what we looked at was we looked at weight promoting meds and their impact on weight in postmenopausal women um, and saw that these agents were to be implicated. And these are just a few representative sample when we look at antipsychotics, antidepressants, our sleep agents, neuropathic agents, beta blockers, steroids, and other drugs that you can see here, much like the ones that I noted. So when we're looking at medications that can be a source of weight gain, we wanna first investigate whether medications are a likely source of weight gain in patients. And if a weight promoting drug may be discontinued, we wanna do that. Um, and then if we cannot discontinue that drug, we wanna consider the use of anti-obesity pharmacotherapy for weight loss in conjunction with appropriate lifestyle changes. So now let's look at these agents that we might utilize for weight regulations. They can be categorized, categorized into three primary groups. Um, number one, in terms of the group, centrally acting medications that impair dietary intake. Um, the second category are medications that act peripherally to impair dietary absorption. And then finally, those medications that work to increase energy expenditure. And these are the main categories that are approved here in the, by the United States. So I know that many of you are from, are from around the world. So you would need to check and see individually what's available in your areas. Um, I want you to see that we have the CNS or the central nervous system stimulants and anorexients here. We have our antidepressants, dopamine reuptake inhibitors and opioid antagonists here. And then we have our GI agents. Now you'll notice some stars that kind of come down here. These are FDA or our federal drug administration here in the United States approved for long-term use. Um, it's important to note that the drug that was first approved here in the United States was Fentramine. It was approved back in 1959 um, and has remained on the market continuously since that time. Fentramine to pyramid is perhaps the strongest combination medication available for weight regulation. Um, and these other drugs are less studied um, 
compared to fentramine, for example, but are very similar. Um, when we look at these antidepressants, antidepressants and dopamine reuptake inhibitors, along with the opioid antagonists, we have bupropion and naltrexone, which is approved in combination by the FDA for long-term use. And then the only drug right now that's really approved, although this actually just changed last week, um, Orlistat, um, which is approved for use in pediatrics and adults. There are a few additional drugs that have come on the market, particularly liraglutide, GLP-1 agonists that have been approved for the use in adults, but just last week is now approved for the use in adolescents here in the United States. There are other drugs that you might utilize for weight regulation. Um, these are um, used a little bit off-label for weight, um, topiramate and zonisamide, which are both anticonvulsants. Bupropion, as you can see that that was approved in combination with another agent, naltrexone. Metformin, which many of us are familiar with, our amylin agonists, um, and our SGLT2 inhibitors, which would be useful in patients that have type 2 diabetes. Now, where do all these medicines work? And you can always go back and look at this recording because um, it's important to note that these medications are acting on different parts of the brain. Why don't we focus on the GLP-1 agonist, for example, and you can see that that's a blue line here. So this works by inhibiting or decreasing food intake in that neuropeptide or goody related peptide neurons that we talked about and stimulates that POMC pathway, the pathway we wanna go down, that pathway that produces brain derived neurotropic factor. It also decreases gastric emptying, as you can see here, it increases insulin secretion and decreases glucagon secretion and then it works to brown white adipose tissue. It increases thermogenesis of brown adipose tissue and it increasing rest, increases resting energy expenditure. So you can see that many of these medications actually have major impacts throughout the body. And this is what leads to the weight regulation that we see with these agents. Now, the most common forms of metabolic and bariatric surgery everywhere in the world, not just here in the United States, are the Renoir gastric bypass and the vertical sleep hysterectomy. By far, VSG, or the vertical sleep gastrectomy, is now king and queen, meaning it is by far the most commonly performed procedure throughout the world. Um, what you can see here is that a large portion of the stomach is removed, and people think that this works because we moved the stomach. But what I taught you guys early is that ghrelin, which stimulates hunger, is housed here in the fundus of the stomach. And so when we remove that, most of the changes that we see are secondary to ghrelin changing, GLP-1 levels being elevated, and several other hormonal changes that, are, that occur actually in association with the surgical interventions, either the sleeve or the root and Y, notice it's a Y, where we bypass um, most of the stomach in the proximal portion of the small intestine. Now, the criteria for metabolic and bariatric surgery here in many places is as follows. If someone has severe obesity, then we would consider them for surgical intervention. Or if they have class two or moderate obesity with these major um, obesity-associated complications of type two diabetes, heart disease, and obstructive sleep apnea. If they've had prior unsuccessful weight loss attempts, so we don't immediately send you to surgery, but we see what's happened. And if you've had not, um, an issue with success, then this may be a great consideration. We do know that a metabolic and bariatric surgery is by far the best treatment we have available anywhere in the world for moderate to severe obesity, both in children and in adults. So this is important for us to note. Now, what happens? Why, why surgery? Why did I say it's by far the best? Because the resolution of obesity-related diseases after surgery is quite pronounced. Let's just look at a few of these. Um, pseudotumor cerebri, which is idiopathic intracranial hypertension, 96% resolved. Obstructive sleep apnea, 74 to 98% resolved. Metabolic syndrome, 88% resolved. Look at this, type 2 diabetes, 82 to 98% resolved. I mean, these are numbers that we just don't see with any of our medications. Quality of life improved in about 95% of patients and mortality reduced by 89% in just a five-year period. So that is pretty drastic and we don't have anything that quite represents that. Now let's look at a few cases because I think it's important for you to look at how I actually do this in practice and then we'll conclude and um, we will open for questions. So I have a 54 year old woman here, past medical history of untreated hypertension. She has a history of migraine headaches. She has a history of GERD um, or gastroesophageal reflux disease, irritable bowel syndrome and metabolic syndrome. She's retained 20 pounds with each of her two pregnancies. Remember those age related changes. Um, and she's tried many commercial programs, which have led to 20 pounds of unsustainable 
That's the key word there, weight loss with each attempt. Her most significant weight loss, she tells me, was the use of a drug called FinFin back in the 1990s here in the United States. She tells me she's lost over 50 pounds in a six month period. So she comes into me interested in medications and she comes in interested in behavioral therapy also. So here's her chart. I want to show you this. Um, there are a few things I want to point out. Um, we have weight in pounds on this axis and we have body mass index here. You can see the dates so or the times across the bottom. So you can see what was going on. That 20 pounds of unsustainable weight loss, you can see that happen. That happens on her graph. She comes into me with a BMI of 40. So she does have severe obesity. Now you can see that she took a lovely dive here to a BMI of 31. And if I were standing with you in person there, I would ask you, what was that secondary to? And I would presume you would guess surgery, especially because we just talked about that. But what I wanna show you here is that this was behavioral modification. It was part of our 12 week program called Healthy Habits for Life. And I was indeed surprised by this response because she had had 20 pounds of unsustainable weight loss with each attempt. So notice she stabilizes here at kind of a BMI of 30. She still has obesity, but very mild compared to previously. And then she takes two additional drops. Um, notice that her, her weight comes down here and she comes down and, and then rebounds a little bit. This is very standard with any modality of therapy, whether it's behavior, medication, or surgery. Um, with this initial thing, I introduced the drug fentramine. We know that that it worked in combination with her in the past. And notice she stabilizes again. And then it was when I added her additional agent of topiramate that we can see that she has maintained herself here at this BMI of 27. So lifestyle combination with pharmacotherapy. Let's look at another woman, 57 year old woman, past medical history of dyslipidemia, breast cancer, hypertension, depression, and pernicious anemia. I give you a little bit more details about what she's eating. Um, so you can see here what she's eating, some brown rice, cashews and goat cheese in the morning. Um, she may have fish with vegetables during lunchtime. She does have some cheese and crackers or some cashews or a protein bar in the middle of the day. Um, and then she has like a salad for dinner. Um, she's pretty active as you can see here. She does exercise classes, cardio interval circuits. She does exercise videos. She tells me she does yoga also to calm down at night. And then she gets eight hours a night of restful sleep. Now let's look at her glass, um, graph. I just want to remind you weight and pounds on this axis, BMI here and time, right? So we have a lot of data on these patients. Many of these patients see me for many, many years. And you can see here that she came in with a BMI of 56, which is quite pronounced. We would call this very severe obesity. BMI is greater than 50, right? Very severe. And so, wow, she took a nosedive. And so, of course, now you guys think that this is going to be lifestyle because that's what I showed in the previous slide. But of course, I wouldn't make it that easy. So this was pharmacotherapy. So she was a potent responder to fentramine and topiramate in combination. But I want you to note something, that her weight comes back up from that BMI of 33 back up to 40, which means she has severe obesity, not quite the severity that she has. And notice she comes down again to BMI of 33. So something happened. What, something, what happened? Here, it's important to note that her doctor stopped her medications. As soon as we stopped the medications, they no longer are working because they're no longer in the system. So back then, the doctor that saw her was like, okay, well, we just use medications temporarily. It's important to use, to note that if the medicines work, we sustain them indefinitely. When we pull away, the brain goes back to where it was prior to the intervention. So you can see she has a, a nosedive here with weight, but not significant. This was a gastric bypass surgery. I think we can all agree that her response was relatively minimal compared to her response initially with pharmacotherapy. Now, of course, when patients come to see me is when things have gotten worse. So this was when I first year at this BMI of 44.5 here. Um, and so what you can see is that she took another deep dive. And my question to you in person would be, what happened? And if you're perceptive, you might recognize that she was coming down here to actually a lower weight than she's ever had. So as a postmenopausal woman, she was at her lowest weight. All I did, I wasn't, just didn't reinvent the will. I saw that she was a potent responder to fentramine to appearing in the past. So why not restart that? And you can see that she's done quite nicely with that. This is my final case um, before we close out. 66 year old black woman here in the United States past medical history of breast cancer, type two diabetes, hypertension, osteoarthritis, and GERD. Um, she comes in, she's doing exercise, exercise four days a week. You can see she's doing two days of cardio, one day of strength, one day of Pilates. 
not sleeping very well. She's an academic physician here in the Harvard system. So we don't sleep very well. We just work all the time. That's typically our status quo. But I want to show you her graph also. So it looks similar to what you can see. What you can see here is a relative weight stability, you know, some ups and downs, but relative weight stability. Of course, she comes in to see me here. Um, I was the person that, of course, to unfortunately diagnose her with type 2 diabetes. Um, and you can see that she's taken a lovely nosedive here. Um, and so I would ask you, what, what did I do for her um, to bring her to this BMI of 27.3? Actually, I just saw this patient two weeks ago, and she's now at a BMI of 25. She's lost 75% of her excess body weight, 20% of her total with a sleeve gastrectomy, okay? So she's done very well. I can send patients in their 60s and 70s for metabolic and bariatric surgery, and they often do quite nicely. So in summary, um, a key things, obesity is a multifactorial disease process, and we do have an increased prevalence of obesity-related diseases in women, um, and so it's important for us to note that. Healthcare providers should be vigilant about making an appropriate diagnosis, particularly in racial and ethnic minorities who tend to have higher rates of obesity throughout the world. Um, Evidence-based weight loss strategies should be entertained in women. Um, I have a book that I wrote here at Mass General, so it's through our Mass General Hospital, Facing Overweight and Obesity, A Complete Guide for Children and Adults. It is available on Amazon, written by myself and some of our psychiatrists here at Mass General Hospital. I find it to be a great reference for both physicians and for patients. And then finally, I'm concluding so that we can go into questions. I'm going to thank you so much for your time. Hopefully, you learned some new things about how to approach your patients with overweight and obesity in the midlife. I hope you're having a wonderful day. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Stanford, and also thank you very much, Professor Kapoor, for this uh, excellent talks. I told you I have several messages to congratulate you for the quality of your speech and several questions as well. So I will begin with the, one of the first questions. What is the place of physical activity and the kind and the type of physical activity in management of obesity in postmenopausal women? So I think it's important for us to note that physical activity, like if we go back to what I said, it really helps with weight stability. I'm not expecting significant loss with regards to weight. However, if we're looking um, at weight loss itself, I would recommend at least 300 minutes of uh, moderate intensity physical activity per week. Um, so that's important. So what does moderate mean? So that means that you could talk during the activity, but you couldn't sing um, unless you're a superstar like Janet Jackson or something like that. Then maybe you could, could do, do it at the same time. Um, in terms of, um, I would like a combination of cardio and strength. So you notice with my patients, they were doing both cardiovascular activities, those things that increase heart rate, but also bone building activities. Dr. Kapoor talked about that decrease in lean muscle and bone that occurs in the perimenopausal and postmenopausal course. We want to work to counteract that as much as possible. It still will happen because we're human. So it will happen, but how do we slow that rate of loss? Um, so those are key things that I think about with physical activity with my patients. And I think it's also about having people find their soulmate workout. Absolutely. What do they enjoy? Because what they enjoy is what they'll do. I agree. Otherwise, it won't, find, it won't work. Don't do it. Absolutely. Thank you. I have another question about the place or the role of androgens in the pathophysiology of postmenopausal obesity. Androgens. Oh, androgens. Yeah. Testosterone, oh. Delta, Delta 4, understand the dion. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know that androgens decrease across the lifespan of a woman. So unlike estrogen, which we will see a precipitous decline after menopause, that's not the trend that androgens follow. So all of them, testosterone, DHEA, androstindion, DHEAS, they are all going down throughout the woman's lifespan. And we think that that decline has a role to play in the loss of muscle mass, potentially loss of bone mass also. So that brings us back to the body composition changes. So I think androgens play a major role in that. Thank you. I have also a question about uh, hypothyroidism in postmenopausal women. Hypothyroidism? Is that what you said? Hypothyroidism. See. What, what, what about it specifically? Was there a specific with regards to it? The question was role of hypogonadal hypothyroidism in menopause from Fred Naftolin. 
Dr. Kapoor, do you want to take that one? Well, I, think I, I, I read that question. I don't think I understand what hypogonadal hypothyroidism no. would mean. That's why I didn't speak about hypogonadal, only about hypothyroidism. But so well, me, uh, occurrence of hypothyroidism is, is frequent at, during the menopausal transition. So maybe this is the question. Uh, incidence okay. hypothyroidism, what I understood from the question. Well, let me, I guess, let me, I, so I think that, you know, one of the things that we are taught in medical school all around the world is that hypothyroidism leads to weight gain. And obviously one of the key things that we're checking um, for patients that come in with overweight and obesity is thyroid status. Um, for many of them, they are, are, um, have normal thyroids or they may have subclinical hypothyroidism. And, you know, I don't think that's the major contributor to their weight shift. Um, I think we want to make it thyroid. I think people have learned that. I think the general public somehow has learned that the thyroid is related to weight. And I'm, I'm not saying it's not. I do think it's related. But um, I think we give it a little bit more credit than it deserves, is what I would say. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. I have also uh, questions arising uh, about um, the role of estrogen. You spoke about uh, Professor Kapoor. But also, which kind of estrogen do you can you tell us if there is a better estrogen, a better treatment, uh, considering sure. the impact on obesity? So, as it relates to the effect on body fat distribution, we are basically driven by the data we have. So, as you know, we don't have as much data on transdermal estradiol as we have on oral estrogen conjugated equine estrogen, because that's the one that has been studied historically. That's what patients used to use back in the past. But if you were to purely ask me what is the preference in terms of oral versus transdermal, transdermal has its advantages in terms of a lower risk of dyslipidemia, lower risk of cardiovascular disease, lower risk of clotting. But if you ask me the specific question of body fat distribution, oral versus transdermal, that really hasn't been looked at. But there are many reasons to choose transdermal over oral for other reasons. Okay, thank you. Uh, question also about tibolon and weight. What was the, what was the word? I'm sorry. Tibolon, tibolon, livial. It's a, it's a, it's a um, treatment uh, uh, which is uh, licensed for um, uh, climacteric symptoms. It's uh, progestin with estrogen and androgen uh, activity. Tibolon. Um, Dr. Kapoor, do you? Yes. Sorry. I don't know that there are any strong data about the effect of tibolone. Again, don't have much literature to suggest one way or the other. Our experience is that a patient takes uh, two to three kilos uh, rapidly, but mostly because of uh, um, water retention and probably. Mm -hmm. um, so I have also a question about obesity and cardiovascular risk. All types of obesity <laughs> do carry uh, associated with the same risk? So do, is what associated with the same risk? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to make sure. All types of obesity. Yeah, is it associated? So yeah, so I would say that, you know, the, the data doesn't tease that out, right? The big epidemiologic studies doesn't don't typically tease out what you saw in the paper that Dr. Kapoor presented, which it means normal weight individuals that carry central adiposity, that central weight versus those that have overweight and obesity. Um, I would say that the studies typically just do a BMI calculation and then look at all cause mortality and demonstrate that patients that have obesity do have a higher risk for cardiovascular events and deaths associated with cardiovascular events. Um, so with that in mind, I mean, I think we just need to think about treating obesity for the disease that it is. Often we see it as a downstream thing when I see it as kind of the elephant in the room. Once we treat the obesity, we're able to treat several other disease processes. The cancers Dr. Kapoor talked about, we're able to prevent the, the risk of those things. What you saw with my postmenopausal women that I presented was that many of them had significant obesity associated complications. Many of them had histories of cancer, had history of heart disease, had a history of, of other issues. And so if we had intervened earlier, so if we decided to treat them when they were children or young adults, you know, the likelihood they would have developed those issues is uh, much slimmer. And so I think we should be thinking about treating obesity 
as soon as able. I treat patients between the ages of two and 89 um, that have overweight and obesity. So I believe in treating across the lifespan. Um, I know we're talking about menopause here, but I think menopausal women are often the decision makers in the family. And so thinking about that as it relates to your family, I think is going to be key. Okay, thank you. I have also a question about uh, contraindication for topiramat. Is there any contraindication for topiramat? Yeah, so topiramate um, is a drug that can be used for a few things. It can be used to treat migraine headaches. It can be used as you know someone that has seizure disorders. But the key things I wanna pay attention to a relative contraindication is nephrolithiasis or kidney stones. Um, it can still be utilized because it can predispose to that. If you have a history of renal issues, um, also I would be careful with the use of topiramate. Um, and then if you have cognitive issues, right, because topiramate causes slowing of the brain waves, which is why it's an anticonvulsant, um, I wanna be careful in those um, areas. And I always say with topiramate to start low and go slow. So start at a dose of like 25 milligrams in the evening, titrate up to 50, but really titrate up slowly. Um, if you start noticing symptoms like word finding difficulties, cognitive changes and things of that sort, you can then come back down on the dose um, without any issues. And you can come back to the dose where you didn't notice any issues in terms of um, any of the, the side effects. There are some questions about the dose you use. Um, people can find that in your publication or? Absolutely, I published a, um, a piece that came out in Surgery for Obesity and Related Diseases. It's called, it's entitled Controversial Issues, um, the Use of Medications. And I actually explain exactly how it dose to pyramid, so nisamide, these things. And I give you step-by-step, step, step one, step two, so if you can look at that publication, which should be available on PubMed Central for free, you'll be able to see um, how I dose the medications. Okay. A question about the regulation of food intake path uh, during childhood or during uh, life. Uh, when do, does it start really? I would say it starts from the time you're born, which is why I talked about like that role that our parents play on our own rate regulation. So I have three-year-olds that come into me. Um, I, we use pounds here in the United States, so I would have to divide it out. Um, that may be 80 pounds. So whatever that would be like over 40 kilos at three. Um, and what you can see in that situation is that they were always significantly above their growth curve. So their brain is signaling down uh, the pathway, that AGRP pathway very, very early. Um, I think we have to recognize it early, right? We have to, you know, when the parents are bringing the, their kid in at three and they're concerned, like, oh my gosh, what's going on? And I'm looking at two parents that also struggle with obesity. I'm, I'm, I'm noticing that the genetic component is, is very strong. And so that pathway can be regulated very early. The problem is in kids, we don't have many medications that we can utilize. Um, and then, um, you know, the American Academy of Pediatrics did come out last year in October with very strong statements talking about the need for early intervention with surgery for the treatment of obesity. So um, that was really surprising because that's typically a very conservative organization. Okay, thank you. I, I'm sorry, but I think we have to close this session of question and answer. Again, I thanks uh, warmly the two speakers and uh, I am sure that everybody enjoyed very much those speaks and um, the answers. And I invite you to go on with that subject to the next IMS Congress, which will be held in Lisbon, Portugal, between the 26th and the 29th of October, 2022. Thank you very much in the name of IMS to all the participants and of course to our two excellent speakers today. Bye-bye.